tenho o enorme prazer de vos apresentar o professor Alan Evans, que irá proferir uma palestra sobre cosmologia, uh, versando sobre a expansão acelerada do universo e a constante cosmológica. A uh, palestra é esta que está inserida na segunda edição da Semana do Universo. A cosmologia é uma área extremamente interessante e fascinante do conhecimento científico. Em particular, a quantidade de dados que nós obtemos através, por exemplo, da radiação cósmica de fundo, torna esta área da física a segunda maior em termos de quantidade de dados, logo a seguir à física de partículas. Mas para tratar estes dados é importante também fazermos um tratamento estatístico. Assim, nesse sentido, diversas contribuições do nosso convidado têm, uh, têm procurado encontrar diversas uh, respostas às nossas questões do conhecimento. Em particular, a descoberta, por exemplo, de não gaussianidades na radiação cósmica de fundo ou o estudo e validação do modelo cosmológico padrão. Até, por exemplo, aplicações noutras áreas, como a imagiologia médica, é pela criação de uma empresa spin-out da Universidade de Edimburgo, que é, do qual é funda, diretor fundador, a Black Forward Analysis. Sem mais demoras, tenho o prazer de dar a palavra ao professor Alan Evans, do Imperial College of London, professor de Astrostatística e investigador em Cosmologia, que também é diretor do Imperial Center for Inference and Cosmology, Uh, é doutorado pela Universidade de Cambridge e tem passado também pelas Universidades de Edimburgo e Princeton. Portanto, faço notar também que, após esta palestra, iremos ter um espaço para discussão uh, e esta palestra será dada em inglês. Ok, so switch back to English. Professor Alan Evans, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. So, uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> I've now exhausted my Portuguese, that is the only word I know, so I apologize that I will give the talk in English, uh, otherwise it would be a bit boring with just one word being repeated over and over again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We're meeting in Tessiera uh, for a summer school with a bunch of students and uh, lecturers to look at the prospects of cosmology with the next generation of telescopes. Uh, so they're still all over there working hard, and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to come here to, uh, to San Miguel, and I'm told uh, by uh, Sofia and Flavio that it's, this is a much better island than Tessiera, so um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to come here. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, this man, uh, His name is Albert Einstein. Uh, you might have heard of him. Uh, if you haven't, he's one of the greatest uh, physicists uh, of all time. Uh, but he made a mistake, or at least he thought he made a mistake. And uh, the subject of the lecture is to, is to go through uh, why he made the mistake and why we think now that, in fact, he was, uh, he was right uh, all along. Uh, He has, as you may know, a very successful theory of gravity uh, called general relativity, uh, which was being developed uh, just over 100 years ago. Um, but he found a problem with it, or what he thought was a problem, when he looked at uh, the universe and thought about the universe um, and the effects of his gravity law on, uh, on the universe. So, just to get a sense of scale and the sense of the size of the universe, we, we need to we need to, to look at essentially uh, most of the observable universe to investigate uh, to answer these questions. So, just to get a sense of the, the the scale of the universe and how empty it is, uh, let's start by looking in our own backyard at uh, at the moon. Uh, our nearest astronomical companion. And I was going to show you a video here, but uh, unfortunately I have no way to get myself to the right part of the video. This is a video of the moon landing of Apollo 11, um, which uh, shows uh, how far away the moon is. Um, you can hear the conversations between the ground control at Houston and the 
uh, astronauts on the moon, and you hear the delay. Uh, so when the uh, when when the ground uh, station talks, you then hear it being played on the speaker in the uh, uh, in the uh, moon lander, and it and there's a delay of about two and a half seconds for the the time that it takes for the uh, the sound, which is converted into a radio signal, and it travels at the speed of light to uh, to the moon and then and then back again, uh, and uh, that takes time. Um, I could play it, but this video is five hours long, and the little <laughs> bit that I want to play happens after four hours. Um, and I have no way with this system of going fast forward to it, so I don't think we'll wait for the four hours to, uh, to hear it. Um, but uh, it's, you, can, you can look it up, it's the CNN uh, covering of the, uh, of the moon landing. Um, okay, so... Which is nothing but... Oh. <laughs> this is it, but I can't move it. So. <laughs> um, so, so the moon is about one light second uh, away from from us. In other words, it takes about that long to uh, for a light signal to, to to go to the moon. So, when you look at the light from the moon, you're seeing it as it was about one second ago. If you look at other objects in the solar system, uh, then these are drawn to scale, but not but the separations are not drawn to scale. Uh, that uh, the sun is about eight light minutes away. So if you look at the sun, which I don't recommend that you do, um, you will see the light, you will see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Uh, and out for these outer planets, it's a few hours uh, away in terms of the light signal. This is still very much in our own backyard uh, of, of the universe. Um, if we go a little further away, we go to the nearest star away from the Sun, which is Proxima Centauri, and it and its companion are about four light years, four and a quarter light years uh, away. So that if you go and have a look at Alpha Centauri, then the light that you see if you go outside uh, would have been emitted just as Cristiano Ronaldo was scoring his second goal for Real Madrid against Juventus in the Champions League final four and a bit years ago. So you're seeing it as it was, just as he put the ball in the back of the net. And between us and there, there's not very much. It's, it's a, it, the, the space is, is relatively empty. If we go a little further uh, away, we, can, uh, we see this, which is the, the Milky Way. So the Sun is part of a disc-shaped ar uh, arrangement of stars um, that is about 30,000 light years uh, to the, to the centre. So the light that you see here from these stars uh, was emitted about 30,000 years ago uh, when the Sahara was wet and not dry at all. And the late Stone Age was just happening in, in Africa. <clears throat> So this is our own galaxy, and I'll be talking about galaxies uh, a lot during this talk. Uh, it consists of about 100,000 million stars, uh, about as many stars as there are grains of sand in a lorry load of sand. So to give you an idea of how many stars there are. But the Milky Way is one of very many galaxies within the universe. Uh, the next big one is this one which is the Andromeda Galaxy, one of the few extragalactic objects you can see with the naked eye. Uh, so the light that you see there was emitted two million years ago, uh, just when the first recognisable human beings were beginning to emerge in, uh, uh, on Earth. What we do now if we're studying cosmology is often to look at the distribution of galaxies throughout the universe, and this is one example of a survey done with a telescope in Australia where each little dot that you see here uh, is one galaxy. Um, and in the whole of the observable universe there are something like 100,000 million uh, galaxies, each of which contains 100,000 million stars, uh, many of which will be like, like our own. 
<clears throat> this is the deepest picture of the sky that's been taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, the Hubble Space Telescope stared at this piece of sky for about three months, collecting photons from the most distant galaxies in the universe. And the most distant ones here, uh, the light left about 13,000 million years ago, which is most of the age of the universe. And so we see these galaxies as they were a long time in the past. Many of the stars in these galaxies uh, will now be dead. They, they will have uh, finished their life cycles. And at that stage, when this light set off, there wasn't very much here. The uh, sun uh, had not formed at that stage, the Earth did not exist, uh, but the light that we're seeing now was, uh, uh, was emitted at that time. So where does Einstein come in? So this is really just to give you a, a sense of the scale of the universe, uh, and it was the, essentially the whole universe that Einstein was thinking about when he uh, worried about his theory of gravity. <clears throat> Einstein's theory of gravity uh, had seen some great successes. So there's a, an experiment that was done by Sir Arthur Eddington uh, to test Einstein's theory of gravity against Newton's theory. Uh, and there was an experiment that shows the difference between the two, and that is light bending. So gravity will bend light. So the, the light from a distant star, if it passes close to the sun, then, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, the matter tells the space-time how to curve, and in that curved space-time, the light path gets bent, and the, the bent space-time tells the matter how to move, or the uh, light how to move in this case. So what we see is that if you're looking at the, at the starlight, which should be coming from here, from A, it actually appears to be coming from B. All right, so if the, if the sun is in the way, then the position of the image uh, will, be, will be moved and it gets moved by an amount which is dependent on the theory of gravity. And it turns out that Einstein's theory gives a shift which is twice, exactly twice as, as much as, uh, uh, as, as Newton's theory. So there's the possibility with looking at uh, this gravitational lensing of, of light to distinguish between the two. And this is what uh, Sir Arthur Eddington did with his colleagues in 1919. Um, now the trouble is, if you want to see a star whose light has passed very close to the sun, it's very, very hot. <laughs> the sun is very bright. <laughs> so you have to block out the light from the sun, and conveniently the moon has the same angular size as the sun, so if you do this during a solar eclipse, the light uh, from the sun will, will be blocked out by, uh, by the moon uh, in, in the way, and then you can see the stars. And this is what they did, and Eddington decided that in order to guarantee success, um, this is the, the, the path of the eclipse, so in, in this range here, region here, uh, this is where the, the, the moon would block out the light from the sun. And Eddington obviously decided that to guarantee success, uh, he should go somewhere where the prevailing language was Portuguese. So he set up an experiment in Subral in Brazil, and another one in Principe, just off the coast of, um, uh, of Africa. And uh, these experiments looked at the uh, position of stars uh, when the eclipse was taking place. And this is almost what they saw. So what you can see here is that, the, that there's two images here, one taken when the sun is close by, where the images get moved uh, away from where they should be, and this other one is when Eddington allowed the sun to move out of the way and uh, took photographs of the, uh, of the positions of the stars. And you see that they've been uh, they've, they've moved in accordance with them being uh, bent around by gravity. Um, this is a fake picture, or it's a 
not based on the fact of the original photographs, but the, the movements here have been increased by a factor of 50, so that they're, uh, they're measurable, or so that you can see them, but you get the general idea. Um, and uh, Newton's theory would predict that they would move uh, half as far as Einstein's uh, the, full, the full distance. Uh, so this was a big success for Einstein's theory. There are some debates about whether the data are really good enough to distinguish between these two theories. Uh, I think they are. Uh, but there were later experiments which were better, which definitely uh, said that uh, Einstein was right. Now, Einstein was very excited by this uh, result, of course. Uh, he wouldn't be. <laughs> uh, so he wrote a, a, a letter, a postcard to his mother, to, um, because he was so pleased. And so here it is, it's in German. Uh, so I'll translate it for you. Uh, it says, Liebe uh, Mutter, dear mother, um, Unfortunately, I don't speak German, so I don't know what the rest of it says, but it starts with dear mother. Okay, so why was um, so he had great success with uh, uh, with his theory in the solar system? Why was he concerned about the universe? Um, so the reason is that at the time, uh, the thought was that the universe was static. It d didn't change, okay? And Einstein thought, well, a static universe is a bit difficult to maintain because if you think about what would happen to, say, a sphere centered on us due to the gravity of the matter within the sphere, then the gravity will cause it to fall in. <coughs> So he was concerned about this, uh, didn't like the idea of a universe that was going to fall in, who would. Um, so he modified his equations of gravity uh, to include an outward force that would precisely balance the force of gravity on large scale. Uh, and this force, I called it here the lambda force, he introduced a, a quantity called the cosmological constant into his equations. Uh, which made the theory a little bit less simple, a little bit less elegant, perhaps. But it allowed for a static universe, if you precisely balance the normal force of gravity and the, this new force uh, that he'd introduced. Turns out it wasn't his best idea, to be honest. Uh, because you can set it up like this, but it's unstable. If you perturb this a little bit, if you bring a bring this in a little bit, the gravity will pull it in. If you push it away a bit, then it will, uh, it will move apart. So although you can, if you set things up really precisely, you can make it static, it's not going to stay like that. This, the tiniest little nudge from anything would cause it to collapse or expand. <clears throat> now the reason that he was um, embarrassed by introducing this cosmological constant is that uh, at around the same time there were observations of the universe that indicated that it was not static and that it was expanding. <coughs> Does anybody know who this scientist is? It's somebody you've probably never heard of called Vesto Slipher. Um, people sometimes think that it's Edwin Hubble whose name is much more famous in, this, uh, in the expansion of the universe. But the, the first uh, observations of the expanding universe were made by, by Vesto Slipher, and these are some of his data, looking at a, a number of galaxies, some tens of galaxies, and uh, the numbers with a plus here are moving away from us, and the ones with a minus sign here are moving towards us. And what you can see here is that most of the galaxies are moving away from us. So he was seeing, generally speaking, with a few exceptions, galaxies moving uh, away from, uh, from the Milky Way. And you can see this in, in this diagram here, that uh, here are these five galaxies which are at different distances. The distances are increasing here. And uh, this is a spectrum of the light uh, there's the, red end, the blue end of the spectrum is here, 
if this were a color photograph, it would be we'd have the rainbow colors going from uh, from the blue uh, up to the red here. And you can maybe just see there's two little dark lines here, which are due to calcium absorbing the, some of the light. Uh, and these two dark lines, the further away you go, uh, these, the further to the right these uh, dark lines move. Uh, and then this is the Doppler effect, or caused by the Doppler effect at small distances. Uh, and this tells you that this galaxy is moving away from us rather slowly. This galaxy over here is moving away from us uh, very fast at 61,000 uh, kilometers per second. And this was Hubble's main contribution, that uh, by looking at some uh, particular kinds of stars uh, whose brightness uh, he knew, or thought he knew, uh, he could determine the distances to these, uh, to these galaxies. Uh, and uh, this particular kind of Cepheid variable star is a very useful uh, way to, to measure distances. Uh, so Edwin Hubble plotted the speed of recession of the galaxies against the distance. And these are his data. Uh, and he fitted a straight line to it. He took the best trend. Quite ambitious, I think, because the data not, didn't really quite lie on the line for reasons that we now understand. Uh, but his general conclusion was correct that galaxies which are further away uh, are moving away faster than the galaxies that are, that are nearby. So the universe is not static, but unfortunately for Einstein, he didn't know this. Okay, so he put in this extra equation to stop it expanding. Um, which is a shame, because uh, if he, if he, what he could have done is to have predicted that the universe should be expanding uh, or contracting. And if he'd done that, he would have been able to, before uh, Slipher and Hubble had found that the universe was expanding, uh, then he could have predicted it and uh, become famous, and then you would know who this person is. <laughs> So it sounds a bit odd that everything seems to be moving away from us. Well, what is it about us that means that the rest of the universe uh, is moving away? <clears throat> so it's a bit more complicated than that, because in fact the, 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 the form of Hubble's law means that although it appears that we seem to be at the centre with everything moving away, uh, we're not necessarily. So to illustrate that, if you take this uh, star field. Let's imagine that uh, we are sitting on one of these um, uh, one of these stars. I've chosen this one, I think. <clears throat> I wouldn't sit on the star if I were a bit hot. <laughs> but let's imagine we, we are here um, and we let the universe expand in exactly the way that, uh, that Hubble says it does. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you can see this terribly well. So what I've done here is to just expand the, the picture a little bit and then superimpose the two. So you'll notice here that this, uh, this star here has moved from here to here. Um, this star here has moved from here to here. And you can see each pair. And if you look at it for a moment, you'll convince yourself that the ones which are further away from here have moved further. And in fact, the, the amount by which they've moved is proportional to their distance away from us. So this is exactly Hubble's law. Um, so basically the whole picture, it's really just like what I've done here, the whole picture just, uh, uh, just expands. <clears throat> now I've chosen this star at, at random, I could have chosen somewhere else. So for example, if we were up here, if we were astronomers making observations from here, you see exactly the same thing. These, these, this star has moved very little, this star has moved a lot more. So in fact anybody anywhere in the universe who is making measurements of the speed and the distance of objects would see uh, Hubble's law. So there is nothing special about where we are, despite uh, Hubble's laws maybe suggesting that that's the case. Uh, so there's no centre of the universe or any, anywhere in the universe could uh, regard itself as being at the centre. 
<clears throat> okay, so let's think about the consequences of having an expanding universe. Um, obviously, objects get further apart over time. So let's run time backwards and ask what happened uh, before now. So here, we're now sitting on the, on the red object here. It's another galaxy of one million light years here and two million light years here. Here's the expansion. And here we see Hubble's law again. This one has gone from one to two. This one has gone from two to four. So it's moved twice as fast. But now imagine running time backwards so that uh, in, in the past, oops, uh, the galaxies would have been closer together. And actually, if we run time backwards for long enough, which means about 14,000 million years, uh, the galaxies would be sitting on top of each other. In fact, it's more complicated than that because at that stage the galaxies didn't exist, but the material that would later form the galaxies uh, would, would all be sitting on top of each other and the universe would be infinitely dense. <clears throat> so that's quite a bold claim to make, uh, that we can just run this backwards uh, to a very an, an event that set the uh, ingredients of the universe moving apart at high speed. Uh, so. I would hope that you would be sceptical enough to ask for some evidence that this has happened. And we do have some evidence, we have plenty of evidence. Uh, one example of which is uh, the abundance of light elements. So if we run time backwards, the universe uh, would have started in a very dense state uh, and it would also be very hot. So the conditions of heat and high density are broadly speaking very similar to the center of a star, where you have many collisions between elementary particles and many nuclear reactions, nuclear fusion reactions typically uh, taking place. So the early universe, if this picture is right, would uh, uh, resemble the center of a star where elements could be made by, by these collisions and nuclear fusion. And we can measure the amounts of these light elements that are produced. If there's, uh, um, deuterium and uh, uh, various other uh, elements, including lithium. Uh, lithium is about the, uh, the, the most massive uh, element which is made in the early universe. And uh, most of the, the world's lithium will have been made this way within the first three minutes or so of the Big Bang. Um, so it was made about 13.8 thousand million years ago. Um, and it's a good job we got it now, because you'll notice here that uh, you have to use this by 2026. <laughs> so it's a good job we collected this just in time to use it before it goes, I don't know what happens in 2026, but we only just made it. So you can look at the, uh, the, the, the abundance of the lightest elements, helium-4, deuterium, helium-3, lithium, uh, and compare it with, uh, uh, with what's predicted from, from the Big Bang theory, and basically they all agree, provided that we have this amount of matter. So the more matter we have, the more collisions there will be, and th that will change the, uh, the amounts of each of the, of the elements that are produced. Uh, but if we have exactly this amount of, of uh, uh, this density of, of, of ordinary matter, then uh, we will get the, uh, the abundances of the light elements correct. And it turns out that that amount of, dark, of, of matter is, um, is actually only a very small proportion of the matter that we see in the universe through from other, other arguments. Uh, so we learn from this that most of the matter in the universe is, uh, it, is not the stuff that, is, uh, is, that we see on Earth. It's something else, and we, we don't know what that is. Uh, it's called dark matter. The other thing that we can find from the uh, that we would expect to see is if the universe started being hot and dense is that we would expect to see the radiation left over from the Big Bang. So when it was very hot it would have a lot of photons uh, of, light in, of, of light in it. And we should see those. Um, and we do in fact. Uh, they've cooled as the universe has expanded uh, and they end up with uh, microwave wavelengths. And we can detect that with telescopes like the Planck telescope shown here. So we see evidence of, uh, of, this, of this happening. Oh. 
this is the sound of what you see here. So, as you see here, the universe started off in a state which was not quite uniform. It had fluctuations in it. These are essentially sound waves in the early universe. And this is what it would have sounded like over a period of some billions of years. So this doesn't tell us very much today. <laughs> but actually, this signal and the, the details of that sound that you hear, if you do statistical analysis of, uh, of, of that, it's absolutely fantastic for telling us about the contents of the universe and the state of the universe. It's a, uh, a treasure trove of, um, uh, of information that's in this. <clears throat> if we have a look and see what happens uh, after the Big Bang, these little fluctuations uh, grow. If there are dense regions here, which are in fact the blue regions here, uh, they, their gravity is a little bit stronger than the surroundings, so they pull matter in. The matter will continue to fall into these uh, and form the structures that we see today. So this is a simulation of the formation of uh, the structures on these very large scales. So each of these dots is uh, probably a galaxy or some uh, fraction of a galaxy. And what you see is a very rich structure of... Um, uh, that, that grows out of these tiny fluctuations. Here's another simulation from the Alaska simulation that uh, shows things on a much smaller scale and shows an individual galaxy forming uh, due to these tiny irregularities growing over time. And you can see it's a very complicated process that uh, forms. We'll form a galaxy, you'll see another galaxy, small galaxy coming in and merging with the bigger galaxy over time. There's another one coming in. So this is how we think that the what we see in the universe has come about. It's basically gravity that just pulls everything in and forms this. So this is the picture that we have. This is a picture through time, starting with the Big Bang, which is the event that sent everything moving apart. We don't fully understand why or how. Uh, this is the, uh, the light from the Big Bang, the last time it did anything, about 13.8 thousand million years ago. And then as time goes on, then the structures begin to form, and we end up with the picture that we see today, this mixture of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and, uh, and so on. So that's the picture that we have. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> That was really the picture that we had until uh, about the year 2000, or just before the year 2000, when something strange uh, happened. Uh, astronomers started looking at objects like this. This is a, a supernova explosion. It's a star which has ended its life um, and, uh, and exploded. It's probably come from uh, a binary system with a white dwarf star here and a companion that has fed mass onto it and uh, the mass can uh, cause the white dwarf to uh, to collapse and then explode. So these things are incredibly uh, luminous, very very bright sources. They can be a hundred million times as bright as the sun. So we can see them a long way away. And uh, the fact that we can see them a long way away means that we can see them a long way back in time because of the speed of light. So we can ask, what would, we, what would we expect to see, given what I told you about the uh, Einstein's gravity law slowing things down, uh, what would we expect to see? So what we can do is to plot the uh, distance of the galaxies and the speed of the galaxies. So here is, uh, this is the slower galaxies here, faster galaxies here, nearby galaxies here, and far galaxies here. So, what we can do is to say, well, if there was an empty universe with no gravity, what would we expect to see? Each galaxy, there would be no gravity, so each galaxy would just move at constant speed. And we would expect to see the galaxies uh, sitting at the top of this pink triangle. So, 
with Einstein's gravity law, what we would expect to see is them not sitting here, but sitting here. In other words, at the time they would been, have to be moving faster so that uh, they would then slow down over time, according to Newton, uh, to Einstein's uh, theory. So that's what we expected to see. So we would expect to see um, galaxies sitting on, along a line like this, but bending over in this direction. So it was a big surprise to find that that's not the case. <laughs> that actually, the edge of this pink line is here, and if you look at these supernovae, you'll see that most of them are to the left of the line, so they were traveling uh, more slowly than they would have to be in an empty universe, um, which means that the universe is, uh, has to be accelerating in its uh, expansion. So that was a big surprise. For new, uh, Einstein's law of gravity should mean that the universe slows down, but it turns out that it's accelerating. <clears throat> so they sit basically to the, to the left, mostly. Okay, so that was um, discovered in the late 1990s that the, uh, that the universe was accelerating in, it, in its expansion. And there's no way to account for that using Einstein's original theory of gravity. Uh, there's other evidence that, uh, that we have uh, from looking at the distribution of galaxies as well. Um, their distribution is affected by uh, the, the law of gravity um, and uh, what we can do is to look at a number of sources of information on the amount of uh, dark matter that is the dark matter plus ordinary matter and this is the amount that we have uh, and this is the amount of the, the size of the cosmological constant which these days is often called uh, dark energy so this is the stuff which is driving the acceleration of the universe. It's the repulsive force which pushes the constituents of the universe apart. Uh, and the supernovae tell us that we have to live somewhere here. Um, the clustering of galaxies tells us we have to live somewhere in the green region. And the fluctuations in the microwave background tell us we have to lie somewhere in the orange bit. Uh, so we learned from that that we live here. <laughs> so we have this much uh, matter, of which only this much is ordinary matter, so the rest of it is dark matter, and we have this very large amount of, uh, uh, of, of dark energy, or equivalently of uh, Einstein's cosmological constant. And the evidence that we have is that if the, if the universe is rather different from this being on this orange line, then the patterns that we see, that you saw in the, uh, in the map of the microwave background, uh, would have a different size. So if the universe were uh, didn't have the dark energy in it, we would expect to see uh, patterns which were smaller. Um, if it had, uh, if there was lots and lots of uh, dark matter more than we think, then the patterns should be bigger. But we don't see this. We don't see this. What we see is this. Okay. So that's the sort of information that we can use to work out how much. Uh, dark energy there is, or how much cosmological constant. And this is it, as I say, about 75% is dark energy, or lambda. Um, about 21% is uh, cold dark matter, there's an M that's missing off the right here, so this is called CDM, and the normal matter is just 44%. So the, the model that we have of, of the universe that um, essentially agrees with pretty much everything is called lambda CDM. So Einstein's cosmological constant here and cold dark matter. And that seems to work. But as one of my colleagues, Tom Shanks, said, uh, there are only two problems with this theory of lambda CDM. Uh, one is lambda and the other is <laughs> CDM. <laughs> so we don't know what this is. We don't really have any idea of why the cosmological constant is there. And we don't know what the cold dark matter is. There are experiments to try to find cold dark matter in the laboratory. They haven't found it yet. So we don't know what that is. And we really don't know what, that, what lambda is. And it's really strange stuff. However, it works. It works extremely well. One of the things that it does is to nicely make the, uh, the, 
the universe a little bit older. Uh, so this shows the basically the, the separation of galaxies uh, plotted against time here. And uh, if we had a, a universe that was uh, that with no matter in it, then this would just be a straight line. But with gravity, uh, the, the the trajectory, the path would look like this as it would gradually slow down. And that actually gives a very short age of the universe of only about 9 billion years. Uh, with the cosmological constant, then uh, we end up somewhere about here at about 14 billion years. Um, so, in, including the cosmolog cosmological constant gives us an age of the universe which is larger. And that's convenient because uh, 9 billion years is a bit embarrassing. Because when you look at globular clusters like this, they have ages of up to 13 billion years. So one of the things that we're uncomfortable with is if the objects in the universe are older than the universe. So by putting in the cosmological constant, then this problem is, uh, goes away. We can do more exotic things. We can look for evidence that uh, the universe has got more dimensions than we think. Uh, if, uh, if it had extra big dimensions, then uh, the gravity um, leaks out into the, into the other dimensions. And the gravity in our part of the universe that, we're, that we can see, our four-dimensional universe, is, is, is modified. And we can look for signatures of that in, in our observations. And again, it's done statistically to look for, uh, for these things. No evidence yet of any extra dimensions that we need to worry about falling into or, or anything, but um, it's something that we can have a look at. So one of the things that we've been looking at this week is how we can use future experiments like the European Space Agency Euclid mission, which will uh, be, uh, go into space I forget when it is now, it's in the next year or two, it's always going a bit later. So, um, and this will give us an exquisite picture of the, uh, of, of, of the universe. It's basically like having a space telescope that can look at most of the sky. So the space telescope looks at tiny, tiny bits of the sky, uh, but this telescope will have the same sort of uh, detailed um, uh, um, pictures, but covering most of the sky. And it'll be fantastic for looking at the uh, state of the universe and uh, will tell us more about how it's evolved and one of the main things that it's going to try and tell us is what this dark energy is. Is it Einstein's cosmological constant or is it something more exotic still? Let me just finish by um, saying, well, we've, we've looked at what's happened in the past, um, what about the future? Well, with Einstein's cosmological constant, the conclusion is that the universe is definitely going to expand forever. So the good news is that we, we won't end up with a big crunch with the universe expanding and then collapsing into a fireball at the end. So that may, that may be reassuring for some. Uh, on the other hand, on the bad news, it means that the universe will just expand forever, get colder and colder, uh, the sun will die, it, things will end up collapsing into black holes. Um, the universe will be empty, we won't see any stars, there won't be any night sky to look at, everything else will have been accelerated away so to the point where we can't see it. Uh, so it depends on your point of view whether you think that's better than a big crunch or not, but um, either way it's not good, but it's not going to happen for a very long time, so uh, we should be alright. So in the end, did Einstein blunder? Well, the answer seems to be no that he introduced the cosmological constant, the lambda force, um, for the wrong reasons, uh, and he regretted it. Uh, it. It seems fairly clear that he did say that it was his greatest blunder, his greatest mistake, uh, to uh, speaking to George Gamow. Um, and, uh, but it turns out that now, since about the year 2000, uh, we really think that it is there, or something very like the cosmological constant is driving the acceleration of the universe. Um, it's not the same value that he uh, introduced. It's actually a bit bigger, so that the outward force is more than he would have um, said. So that it's actually pushing things uh, pushing things apart. So although it's true that Einstein's theory without 
the cosmological constant is simpler and more elegant. As Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And the universe is telling us that uh, it's really not quite as simple as it might have been, and we just have to, uh, to embrace that. Okay, I will stop there, but I will take any questions if you have any. Okay, so if you want, uh, want to address some question to Professor Allen, please be free to do so. If you are not comfortable with English, you can ask in Portuguese and I will translate. Do you want to say that in Portuguese, just in case? <laughs> <laughs> I can ask one question, I think it's probably some basic physics. But you said that Einstein predicted a shiver. If Einstein predicted a shift of the light in that, ex uh, you know, in the eclipse experiment, yes, yes. which was twice the one predicted by Newton. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm wondering why would uh, this Newton theory predict a shift of light in the uh, light? That's a very good question. Okay. So um, it, it might do. <laughs> uh, it's so Newton's theory says that the force is, as you know, proportional to the mass of the particle, mm. which is, uh, which is, it, it is acting on. And you can ask, what is the mass of a photon? Does it have any mass at all? So you have to uh, say, okay, well, maybe I, Newton might have said the mass is zero, but we know that a photon has energy, so we can uh, adopt some of Einstein's ideas, E equals mc squared, and assign a mass to it and, and pretend that it's a, a massive particle. Um, I mean, nothing really quite works because um, in, in Newton's theory, the, the speed of light, the speed of the light particle as it goes around the sun would not be constant. So it's, it's a little bit of a, 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 an artificial argument, I would say. Okay. Um, so it, there's maybe an argument for saying it shouldn't be bent at all, but that is clearly ruled out. Um, but if you if you take sort of Newtonian like arguments, it will give you a half. Mm. Uh, okay. But it's not perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mix. A mix. A little, little bit of a mix. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I can make a second question. <laughs> when there were these spectacular results about the expansion of the universe, some people complained about the validity of the conclusion about it. I remember there were some arguments such as that the, the part of the, there, the part, there was a part of the sky that was surveyed. I'm not sure if I remember well. And some people complained that these results came on from uh, studying only a part of the sky mm. and not, uh, you know, an isotropic uh, sample mm. of galaxies. And uh, um, I guess these problems have been solved by now. <laughs> Actually, there's a few people who still uh, <laughs> still argue about that. Oh, okay. um, uh, so, uh, I mean, there are many more supernovae now than there were at that stage. But I think uh, I think it is important to to say that uh, to to sort of look at um, things like this to say that the the arguments for us having a lot of this lambda are not coming just from the supernovae. Uh, in fact, the supernovae on their own would allow smaller amounts of lambda. But it's the combination of the exquisite measurements of the microwave background that tell us so much. I mean, this is the uh, this is uh, 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 you know, coming from exquisite observations and other lines of evidence. And we've also done work that gives another. Uh, bar that looks that is more or less the same as the as, as this one. So everything is pointing towards this. Um, I think you're right that if we only had the supernovae, then though on, on on its own those are maybe not strong enough. I mean it's fairly clear that zero is not on the land. So there's some strong evidence just from the supernovae that uh, But you could, you could take away the supernovae and just look at these two and you still get the same amount. So there's lots of lines of evidence and everything points to that. 
I have also a question exactly in this diagram here. You explained that on the left side, so where we on the left side, that is the ordinary matter, on the right side is the dark matter. Could you explain me why? <laughs> okay, so, so I didn't quite mean that. All I meant was that this tells us that the amount of matter in total is in these strange units is about 0.25 or 0.27, something like that. Um, but in these units, the amount of ordinary matter is only 0.045. So only about one fifth of this amount is ordinary matter. So I didn't mean that it was sort of sitting on the left or anything. So I wasn't clear. Uh, and that's you know this is this is strong evidence that there is there is dark matter as well as ordinary matter. But what it is, we're not sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Any more question? Please <laughs> feel free to ask. Alguma pergunta também pode ser colocada e traduzida aqui. Perhaps I will pick a, a question to you. Regarding the, uh, uh, the tension, the double constant tension, what are your uh, thoughts on that? Okay, so, so I said that this model of so-called lambda CDM fits everything very well. Um, that is pretty much the case. Um, but uh, there is one place where it doesn't quite agree with other measurements that we, that we make. And one is that if you take the microwave background measurements and say, if lambda CDM is the right, the right model, if Einstein was right, then we can predict what the rate of expansion of the universe is today, and that is Hubble's constant, uh, basically the slope of that diagram that Hubble made. Uh, we can predict what that should be just from the measurements of the, uh, of the microwave background, uh, these things here. Um, and it's a bit smaller than we measure, or that some people measure. Um, so, uh, at the moment, I, I mean, I think it's remarkable, really, that you can take this, which was emitted 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and take a model which then uh, works out what the universe should look like today, which is 13,000 million years later. Uh, and it predicts a, an expansion of the universe, which is almost exactly what we see to within about, uh, let's see, uh, something like 5%. So it's, it's doing pretty well, but it's not quite what we observe, what we measure. Um, my feeling is that the problem is probably with the measurements of the expansion rate of the universe now, and actually this is more likely to be right. Um, there are several ways that you can measure the, uh, the, the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, and uh, the one which has traditionally been used, which uses Cepheid variable stars and supernovae, uh, gives this value which is a bit high. Um, but there are other methods uh, that have come along, uh, one using the tip of the red giant branch, uh, which don't give this, they give something which agrees with the, uh, with the microwave background. But the data from gravitational waves do not. So, gravitational waves, uh, at the moment, it's fine. Um, they, w we only have one really good example <laughs> of two neutron stars that come together, and, and from one object you can measure the Hubble uh, expansion rate, uh, only rather imprecisely, with quite a big error, and the error is fine, it's, it's quite big. It's an interesting thing that in future, when we find more and more, then we can analyze the set of these neutron star uh, um, coalescence uh, objects, and if we get enough of them, then we can get a good measurement of the Hubble parameter. So at the moment, I think the measurements are a bit confused. Um, there isn't uh, a, th th there isn't strong enough evidence that there's a disagreement. That I, I would say. Um, so others disagree. Uh, others think it's, <laughs> it's, it's an important uh, distinction. Yeah. Any more question? A final one, at least. Okay. Um, 
you showed the picture where you um, showed us the star which we sit on or not sit on and the, how the expansion of the universe looks like according to the Hubble constant and you said well we don't know if we are the center and everything's expanding from us and I was reminded of the thoughts of the planets revolving around Earth rather than the Sun um, and I didn't quite get if there is a model um, which explains why it looks like um, everything's moving um, farther away um, as it is farther away from us or if it's just an observational error we can make by observing the planets from Earth because you can um, calculate um, ways that the planets around revolve around Earth but it's more complicated to assume they revolve around the Sun. Okay, yeah, so I think uh, I think the situation in the in the universe is, is simpler, I would say. It's really a very simple picture. Uh, that you have a set of objects and then sometime later the pattern of objects, galaxies, is exactly the same but it's just everything has moved further apart. And that's a, uh, a very simple description of what's going on. And it's, a, it's a good approximation to, to what we see. Um, it's not quite exact because, as we saw, because of these little irregularities that, that gravity will, will move things around a little bit. So you don't quite get that, but, but um, to a good approximation you, you do. Um, so I think it's actually very much, much simpler than, uh, okay. than the solar system in that regard. Okay. Any more questions? So if not, Let's thank once again to Professor Alan Heavens for being here with us and sharing his knowledge with a wonderful talk. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. I use my word. <laughs>